Alaska is calling, and we must go. Four friends embark on a dream Alaskan adventure. We'll start this video on day two at Drayton Valley, Alberta, having left behind the flat prairie of Saskatchewan and our home province of Manitoba. The Wilmore Wilderness Park along the Alberta-BC border gives us just a taste of what's to come. That's Mike's Cessna 185 Skywagon. And this is my ride in Curtis's Bearhawk Patrol. Autopilot can be a friend, especially when your passenger, Bob, is also a pilot. A decision was made tonight over at Telegraph Creek, BC, and clear the mountains to Juneau the next day. There was no shortage of wind, and we tried to find shelter to pitch our tents. The day's first leg through the mountains had us take a VFR route due to smoke at higher elevations. A brief fuel stop at Prince George, and then a more direct route to Telegraph Creek. Good morning, Bob. Pretty sure we heard a bear in your tent during the night. Mike acquired a permit to bring his version of bear deterrent. Just to be safe, Mike purchased some extra fuel from a local. We leave Telegraph Creek under clear skies but that's soon followed by a low cloud ceiling which has us flying a VFR route to Tulsaqua, where we turn and follow the Taku River the rest of the way to Juneau, Alaska. That's a lot of rubber. Parked and waiting on U.S. Customs. The first leg of the day, Telegraph Creek to Juneau. Clouds are lifting for what looks like a great afternoon of flying. Muddy waters from combined glacial streams enter Burners Bay. The long dark lines on a glacier are called moraines. As glaciers flow down a valley at a rate of several inches to several feet per day, 
they erode the valley walls and collect rock and sediment along their sides. Those lines are lateral moraines. When two glaciers merge, the inner two lateral moraines combine to form a medial moraine. As more glaciers feed into the main glacier, more medial moraines are formed. We'll see more of this throughout the video. The farthest point of advance where a glacier deposits its sediment is called a terminal moraine. We were so fortunate to have perfect weather the day we flew the coast. Mike and Bob spotted this cool arch, so we swooped in to film it. We buzz a section of the shoreline looking for something suitable to land on. Nope, too narrow. We'll keep looking. After an initial touch and go, we fulfill a trip bucket list item, landing on the Alaskan coast. You can see how the plane's weight squeezes water out of the wet sand. Juno over Haines to beach landing. Our first grizzly bear sighting followed immediately by our second. The Italio River Forest Service Cabin and Airstrip. It's where we'll spend our first night in Alaska. Battery powered electric fencing to keep the bears out. Off to explore and get water. Look at the size of those grizzly bear tracks. Wow. purifying river water. These seasoned players try to teach me some cribbage. 
Our game is interrupted when a moose is spotted near the cabin. Back to the game, something we enjoyed most every evening. Filmed just after midnight. Our trip coincided with Alaska's longest daylight of the year. I got up to film this just before sunset at 1 a.m. Sunrise was a mere two hours later. Beach landing to Italio River. The film crew setting cameras. Amelia Earhart once said, The lure of flying is the lure of beauty. Italio River to Yakutat. A brief stop at Yakutat for fuel, a meal, and we're flying again. The Hubbard Glacier was easily the glacier highlight of our trip. Note the cruise ship on the left. What a jagged wall of ice. We then flew a number of miles up onto the glacier. How would you describe these mesmerizing pools of blue water? Beautiful but unforgiving landscape. The freedom of flight versus stuck on a boat. Yakutat to Icy Bay. Flying into Icy Bay with its numerous glacier walls. Wave to the camera, say goodbye to the coast, and head inland. Mesmerizing blue water. River waters meander along endless channels in a typical Alaskan braided river. We set up to land on the shore of the Tana River. A 
strong side wind proves challenging. Icy Bay to Tana River. Jake's Bar Forest Service Cabins. Don't want to be off center here. Tana River to Jake's Bar. Watch your head there, Kurt. Hmm, no hot showers. Some bear deterrent. A food cache. Off to check out another site. Here we check out the May Creek cabins. Very nice grass airstrip. Jake's Bar to May Creek. Great location with a choice of several cabins. We went with the one nearest to our airplanes. Recharging empty camera batteries. Hungry, we prepare some delicious freeze-dried meals. Then, a hike to fetch some water. Glad to see the bears are focusing on berries. The film crew gets into position and Kurt does the honors. It's that time of the day when we relax and enjoy another friendly game of cribbage. I believe this was the only time we were tempted to use insect repellent. Departing May Creek with another great day ahead. Beautiful Alaska. The dream continues. Overfly and have a look at Pea Vine, cabin site and airstrip.
this strip is a bit of a roller coaster ride at the eastern end. May Creek to Peavine. Short stop to check it out and we're off. A scenic route is planned via Russell Glacier, Nazina Glacier, and then to Fireweed for fuel. That's McCarthy there behind the plane, and fireweed here on this side of the river. Fuel at fireweed must be arranged beforehand. Fuel prices in Alaska ranged from under $8 to over $11 per gallon. Everything is documented. Peavine to Fireweed. Fly back over the river to historic McCarthy, where we'll call it a day. We were lucky to get rooms at Ma Johnson's Hotel. Built 110 years ago, it was originally a 20-room boarding house, probably for miners. Hungry, we head down the street to the Potato for a welcomed burger and maybe even a beer. Displays from the nearby copper mine. It seems most everyone has a dog here. These guys thought that they'd struck gold with these cinnamon buns. Bus ride to the Kennicott Copper Mine. After a decade of construction, the mine went into production in 1911. One of the bunkhouses and staff quarters. The last four remaining workers from the 1920s During peak production, 300 people worked in the mill town and 200 to 300 in the mines. Before it closed in 1938, 200 million dollars of copper ore was processed. Mm -hmm. 
Next up, view the copper mine from the air. Head back to Peavine Cabin to unload our gear before we head out for another adventure. McCarthy to Peavine. Here on the Nazina River, we come across the stranded remnants of a bridge built in the 1920s to help prospectors reach their gold camps. This song, entitled Under the Big Blue Sky, couldn't possibly be more fitting. Enjoying more of Alaska's beautiful scenery. A brief and rare encounter with a rain cloud. Gorgeous view as we fly over the Wrangell mountain range. There in the distance, just off to our right, is Regal Mountain at 13,845 feet. After crossing the mountain range, we visit the Nazina Glacier and we'll land to have a closer look at its terminus on foot. Vine to Nazina Glacier. Pretty cool. Wish we'd brought our paddle boards.
keepsake photo of Kurtz Bearhawk before we leave. Back into Peavine, where we'd left our gear. We're in, shiny side up. This arrival is good for three landings. Nizina Glacier to Peavine. five-star accommodations down to the river to replenish our water supply where have you played horseshoes in a more scenic setting keeping that logbook current The morning's ritual, Maxwell House to the rescue, a bowl of oatmeal and we're set for the day. One last stop. Pilots briefing. Off to Talkeetna, a staging destination for tomorrow's anticipated flight to Mount McKinley. While we took a lower elevation route along the Talkeetna River Valley, Mike cut the corner and took a scenic flight up over the clouds. fuel stop at Fireweed. Fireweed to Talkeetna. Took a bit, but we found one vacancy at Climber's Cabin. Nice little town. Now this is a trap. Talkeetna is a staging spot for many bush pilots serving the north, as well as scenic tourist flights. Off to fly Denali National Park, and hopefully get a good look at Mount McKinley, the tallest mountain in North America. Ah, there it is. Alaska is shining on us again.
As we say goodbye to the mountain, we're given a rainbow to finish the experience. Show off. We know you can reverse that 185 on the ground, but this is ridiculous. Flight around McKinley. Having Mike's 185 pickup truck carry the bulk of our supplies was great, even if he continually protested it. Goodbye to Talkeetna. And goodbye to Alaska. You treated us well and gave us more than we could have expected. We experienced no weather delays and hit all our targets. It truly is the last frontier. Next visit, Dawson City, Yukon. We're greeted immediately by friendly Canadian Customs officials. Customs officer. So, Mike, you're telling us all those bags are not yours and you don't know what's in them? Talkeetna to Dawson City. Stepping back in time in historic Dawson City. And if you're in Dawson City, you have to see a show. On the East Coast, you kiss the cod. And here, you let some dead guy's toe touch your lips. So Bob insisted, and I got rooked into this somehow. You can drink it fast, you can drink it slow, but this nasty toe must touch your lips. Not your teeth, not your tongue, and certainly not your tonsils. There you go. Slide her on down and make it hit your, make it hit your lips. Okay. Awesome. Good job. You are now a member of the official Sour Toe Cocktail Club. Whoa, check it out. Back to our room where we were relegated to playing cards because someone, Mike, forgot the crib board in his plane. We just have to check out this monster ourselves. That's Curtis standing underneath the digging ladder where a chain consisting of 72 buckets weighing over 3,000 pounds each would dredge 18,000 cubic yards of gravel each day. At the other end, a conveyor belt in a stacker would expel the cleaned gravel called tailings. This bohemoth would float in a pond created by its own digging. Only one man would control all moving parts from within this room. One can't imagine the deafening roar of gravel and rock as it moved through the dredge. During its 46 years of operation starting in 1912, it mined nine tons of gold. Now it was time to try our hand at striking it rich. The 
The lesson was don't quit your day job. Looks like some folks were in need of a timeout period. These tailings from dredging remain as a vast rippled blight on the landscape. Last look at dredge number four from the air and we set a heading towards Watson Lake, Yukon. Beautiful setting for an airport beside Watson Lake. With tons of space, we decide to land directly into the wind. Batten down the hatches before heading to town. Dawson City to Watson Lake. A must visit is the signpost forest, which is mind bending. They say there's more stolen property here than in any other single place on earth. Mike actually found his hometown, Roland. And Bob did as well, Carmen, Manitoba. Couldn't ask for better conditions as we head for home. We came to experience the magic of Alaska, and we're not disappointed. Nature like this is a necessity for the human soul.